Right, I'm starting already, youngsters. All right, so we're going to look at Tacitus. We're very lucky with Tacitus because it's not actually that long. Let me just start again. You know why? Because I have to set. Okay, we're here doing a revision session. I'm going to look at Tacitus today because I think it's such an important counterweight to both Suetonius, but especially to Res Gestae. So when we want to take a critical view of um, Augustus, Tacitus is definitely our man that we can reach to. And the first thing I'd say is it'd be nice to learn some quotes from Tacitus, wouldn't it? Just short little quotes that you could weave into your work. That said, if you can't, then accurate paraphrase will do. So I'm just going to make this a kind of whistle-stop tour of the ten chapters of Tacitus, okay? First thing to remember is he's writing over a hundred years later. So again, you've just been talking about Arian on the Greek side of the course. We have to be quite skeptical of things. But do we give it some kind of authenticity and credibility? I would say yes, because it kind of shows that there is an, an opposition that remained to the idea of monarchy in Rome. And it shows that that republican ideology remained alive. So that in itself is evidence, isn't it, of opposition to Augustus. Now you will recall that one of the first things Augustus does after Actium is to burn all the stuff that's negative of him in the libraries. Yeah, So we have this kind of censored, whitewashed history. Tacitus shows that in the corners of Rome, people were still whispering opposition to Augustus and to the whole idea of a kind of imperial leader. And he opens the annals. We don't have very much about Augustus at all, but what we have is so valuable, isn't it? He opens it with a defense of the Republic. He talks about liberty and the consulate were institutions of Lucius Brutus. So he reaches to the very beginnings of Rome and he idolizes the Republic and he shows that there was still a lot of nostalgia for this Republican ideal. He says, dictatorships were always a temporary expedient. That in itself infers that there's a problem with powers for life. Now we know that the imperial role in Rome was powers for life, but it, that it was disguised and camouflaged, don't we? We know that many of Augustus in particular went to great pains to disguise his power to hide it, didn't he? And I think that you can use Tacitus to kind of call his bluff. He says here, the consular authority of the military uh, tr uh, tribunals long lived. And he goes on to say, neither Sinna nor Sully create, Sulla, sorry, created a lasting despotism. So even these two villains of Roman history were temporary. So again, uh, what, what's he inferring? He's kind of inferring that the imperial thing was worse. Bearing in mind now that he's writing a hundred years into imperial rule, he's looking back at this catalogue of horror. He goes on to talk about something very interesting. He says, um, Lepidus and Antony, their swords to Augustus, under the style of prince. Now we must remember that when this translation of the word from Latin would be princeps, wouldn't it? Princeps was not what we... Uh, would see it as today, would we? It was in fact a republican word. And why that's so important, it reminds you that um, Augustus used a lexical field of the republic to hide a monarchical structure. And knowing a lot then about his different titles is really important, isn't it? Knowing the princeps senatus, then the first among equals, then the father of the nation, all of these fuzzy titles, fuzzy warm titles that disguise the potestas and emphasize the autoritas. So two Latin words that you really need to use in your essays when you're talking about the nature of Augustus's power. Tacitus goes on to say, but while the glories and disasters of the old Roman commonwealth have been chronicled by famous pens, and intellects of distinction, 
So he praises those historians. What he says is he criticizes a lot of his contemporaries, doesn't he? What does he call them? He says uh, that they, there's a rising tide of sycophancy. What's he talking about? He's talking about the kind of literature and stuff that we have studied, the Mycenae stuff. And what he's saying is, under Augustus, the historians became propagandists. At the moment, if we go down to the bottom of the paragraph, he says, by contrast, he will write without anger, without partiality, from the motives of which I stand sufficiently removed. So he's arguing there, isn't he, that the historical distance is allowing him a kind of honesty and impartiality that contemporaries of Augustus didn't have. He's also suggesting, isn't he, that they simply gave propaganda history. That said, he says that um, he's going to have no partiality. I think we can see it's framed immediately as a kind of pro-Republican, fairly nostalgic account of the old Roman virtues. This is something that's very interested in Roman writing. Both conservatives, uh, people like Augustus, also talk about the Roman virtues. And Tacitus, who's anti-Augustus, does the same thing. So really, his agenda, as I've written here, is to rewrite history, to find a counter to the official Augustan line, which he seems to be suggesting has taken over and has poisoned the kind of intellectual independence of Romans. Okay. Now, notice the way in which he writes. In Res Gestae, we're told that at the age of 19, do you remember, that uh, Augustus raised an army and single-handedly saved the Republic. Look at how it's counterphrased by our man Tacitus. When the killing of Brutus and Cassius had disarmed the Republic. So rather than seeing it as saving, he sees it as taking away any protection that the Republic had against the warlordism of Octavian and the Second Triumvirate that you will remember formed after the Battle of Mutina. Yeah? He then goes on to say, after laying down his, um, uh, Augustus's triumphal title, and proclaiming himself a simple consul content with tribunician authority, again, the implication is that Augustus is the great showman. And of course, as you will remember, students, you have to know the first settlement. Do you recall Cassius Dio's account of how Augustus laid down all the powers and then all the senators called for him to take the powers back? And Cassius Dio suggests that that was a piece of political theater and spin, doesn't he? Well, he takes that from Tacitus. Tacitus is clearly claiming here that Augustus used that to camouflage his real intentions. We are also reminded that the tribunician authority is absolutely key to being emperor, isn't it? And it will be the tribunician authority that takes center stage. When Augustus decides who's going to be emperor, and in this case it's, Tacitus, uh, it's Tiberius, he is given the tribunician authority. So we're reminded once again of the kind of cloaking of power that Augustus engaged in, all right? And at the end of the talk, I'll show which kind of questions we would use all of this for. We also reminded, look at this, that he conciliated the army by gratuities. Now, we know that Res Gestae actually um, supports this because Res Gestae is filled with you know, a catalogue of all the money that he gave. And a great deal of that money was given to the military. So we are reminded, aren't we, that the claim in res gestae that I had no potestas, only autoritas, is untrue. And this would be good to cross-reference with the fact that the army swore loyalty to Augustus, not to the Roman state. Do you recall that? The army were paid by Augustus. It, it, in a sense, in today's language, we would say the army was kind of privatized, but with Augustus as the only shareholder. So he controlled the legions, didn't he? 
So again, Tacitus, very good for undoing many of the claims of res gestae that he had no patastas at all. Also, we're reminded that what the thing that the Romans loved about their state was the separation of powers. And we hear that in talks about the United States today, don't we? Tacitus goes against this. He says, the functions of the Senate, this is a quote you must learn, the magistracy and the legislature were subsumed by Augustus. So if we get any sort of question on powers or the Senate or, you know, the independence of Rome, etc., according to Tacitus, there was none. And you had a complete concentration of all of these officers in one man. Now that sounds like imperial rule, doesn't it? Remember that Augustus will spend all that time denying that, but here we seem to have the confirmation that that's what happened. Now we know, don't we, the stricken fields and the proscription lists are the lost history that is not mentioned in Res Gestae. Suetonius does touch upon them, but Tacitus is far more bitter and angry about some of these injustices that have been written out of history. So one of the things that Tacitus wants to do is to sort of, I was going to say, re-include, if I could use that word, these incidents that have been erased from history. And this is why he's so valuable, to give us that hidden, erased history. Now, he's, very, he's writing to his own class, is he not? He's writing to the nobility, of whom he is a member. And he's angry with them, don't you think? And he is actually quite antagonistic, while the rest of the nobility found a cheerful acceptance of slavery, the smoothest road to wealth and office. Now, he's chosen that term slavery very carefully, hasn't he? To the Romans, it would be an absolute disgrace to be seen as a slave in this way. It's almost like he's trying to provoke them into accepting how much power the nobility have lost, how much power the senators have lost, and how the power has been subsumed and taken by these emperors. Don't forget, he's not writing after Augustus, is he? He's writing after Tiberius, Caligula, Nero. And he is squarely blaming Augustus for these people. Because even though Augustus wasn't as bad as them, he set up the structures which enabled them, didn't he? And he's kind of, by implication, saying, this is where your policies lead, isn't he? And then he goes on to say here, as they had thriven on revolution, stood now for new order and safety in preference to old order and adventure. So, I think Tacitus is being quite balanced. I don't know how you guys feel. He is saying, yep, things got better. We got safer. And in a minute, he's going to say, we got nice roads and cities. But something was lost. So this is the old Roman conception of Roman virtue and freedom. It's basically a cry for liberty, uh, the annals, isn't it? Yeah. So we'll move on, OK? Now, don't worry, because I'm not going to go into so much detail on the rest, OK? What he says and on page uh, two over here in chapter three, which is quite interesting, I won't go into all the details, but notice he talks about Nero, Drusus, and the title of Imperiata, uh, 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 Imperata, and the family proper. What he's showing us here is that essentially we have lineage, we have monarchy, don't we? So he's forcing his Roman readers to admit that they cannot lie and be deceitful and live in bad faith. They are dealing essentially with Eastern Star monarchy, which is what Augustus uh, denied so powerfully all of his life, yeah, and even into his death. Don't forget Res Gestae was his way of consolidating his version of history in which he, be, he appears as a kind of saviour of the Republic and not a dismantler of the Republic and, the, uh, and a bringer of monarchy. Okay, So all of this paragraph here, if you do get this as a source, is about the elaborate plans for succession. And if you were to cross-reference, you would cross-reference to Augustus's mausoleum, which began to be built immediately after Actium. And that suggests 
that the monarchical plans were there all along, doesn't it? And that this is what he aimed for. He also wants to remind us of some of the darker things that Augustus wrote out of the history, in particular the Varian disaster of AD 9 in the Teutoburg Forest, remember, where the three Roman legions were destroyed, weren't they? The greatest disaster of Augustus's uh, life. Suetonius says that Augustus cried, Varius, where are my legions? Do you remember that? So we know that that was a great symbol of his kind of military failure. And there weren't many of them, were there? And of course, in terms of studying the frontier policy, it means that then he fell back uh, till after the Alp, and he never tried to um, conquer Germania after that, did he? Okay. So you could see that both as good and bad. You could see it as a military disaster, but you could also see it as evidence of Augustus's caution in not wishing to expand the empire all of the time. Now, on to page 3, uh, chapter 3, there's a couple of wonderful quotes for the exam. It was thus an altered world, and an old, unspoiled Roman character, not a trace, lingered. Here is this beautiful nostalgia, isn't it? What is he actually complaining about? He's complaining about the fact that Augustus was not a, res a respecter of Roman traditions, was he? He was actually somebody who annihilated these traditions. And that the implication here is that there was a moral deterioration as a result of Augustus's reign. Now, we know from the Lex Julia, do you remember from his moral laws about adultery and how you had to wear togas and how women shouldn't watch half-naked men wrestling and all that, that he liked to see himself as a moralist. This is part of Tacitus's plan to dismantle this notion of the virtus, you know, the manly, virtuous Augustus, yeah? He goes on to say, and I want you to see, look at the lexical units that he's using. Sovereign. He says it over and over again. It's like he's tweaking the Romans' faces and he's saying, yes, you do have a king, isn't he? So he deliberately chooses the word sovereign and he avoids Augustus's terms, in particular, princeps, which, as I said, seem to be about camouflaging that potestas and not acknowledging it, yeah? And at the end of this paragraph, the only thing I thought worth saying that is really important is note the bitterness of the tone. Add to the tale his mother with her feminine caprice. They must be slaves, it appeared to the distaff, and a pair of striplings as well. Given that he said he's going to be impartial, and without rancor, don't you feel there are lots of moments where his anger is transparent and where we can feel the kind of republican agenda that he sets out with, okay? Now, one more thing that I want to do on this page that I thought was quite useful was he doesn't write much about Augustus, but a lot of what Tacitus writes in these ten annals is exposes the elaborateness of the um, monarchical plan to leave a relation in charge. And it also reflects very much on the legacy. So if you're writing an essay about Augustus's legacy, sometimes it's hard to criticize Augustus, isn't it? Because he does well militarily. He secures the frontiers. He builds great buildings. He's good on infrastructure, isn't he? He solves food problems, etc. He pacifies all kinds of regions. He damn well does a lot right, doesn't he? He reforms the Senate and the army. But ultimately, we have to judge somebody by their legacy. And that's where I think his Achilles heel is. I don't know how you guys feel. Tacitus is good to expose the fact that the legacy was not good at all. And that what he left behind... Uh, resulted in bloodshed, excessive power for individuals, a weakened, disempowered Senate, uh, an inability to resist the whims of the despot, the emperor, etc. And of course, the person who um, succeeds Augustus is Tiberius, and the way that um, Tiberius is characterized by Tacitus is as being bloodthirsty, 
isn't it? It says here, whatever the truth of the affair, Tiberius had hardly set foot in Illyricum when he was recalled, da 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 da, and in a moment he's going to tell us the first act of Tiberius's reign was to kill Agrippa Posthumus, who in fact was defenseless and imprisoned on an island. So this kind of shows us, doesn't it, that the opening of this new form of government, which Mommsen wrongly termed diarchy, do you remember that? The opening of this new form of government is bloodshed, isn't it? And the implication is the bloodshed is the result of the political system that Augustus leaves in his wake. So if you get any question on legacy, you've got to talk about Tacitus, haven't you? You can have Augustus's own version in the Res Gestae, and you can have a little bit from Suetonius, and you can really then counterbalance it with uh, Tacitus's account, which is actually incredibly withering, isn't it? On to chapter 7 next, okay? At Rome, however, consuls, senators, and knights were rushing into slavery. That's a lovely phrase to remember, isn't it? Rushing into slavery. Feel the... Is this impartial? Or is it kind of loaded, highly emotive language that betrays his anger? The more exalted the personage, the grosser his hypocrisy and haste. So in particular, he is reserving his criticism for the Roman elite, isn't he? And he is pointing out, isn't he, that they have been self-interested and bribed all of the time, yeah? And he goes on to say, his lineaments adjusted so as to betray neither cheerfulness at the exit nor undue depression at the entry of the prince. He tears, his, uh, is blent with joy, his regrets with adulation. What he's saying there is, all of these guys are basically scripted. So if you get a question then on the Senate, was it meaningful, etc.? Well, Tacitus says, no, they were just taught their lines and they uh, simply mouthed them as was required of them. Okay, as we're in a hurry, I'll move on to chapter 8. And what I'm trying to do is gloss the 10 chapters and take out the absolute key bits for you, all right? What I thought was very interesting in chapter 8 was, again, money. His be uh, bequests were not above the ordinary civic scale, except he left 43 million. Oh, what, how much is that? I can't even say, you know, I'm terrible on numbers there. What is that? Is that 43 million, 500,000? Am I right? Yeah. Sesterces to the nation and the populace. A thousand to every man in the Praetorian Guard. So Tacitus is always at great pains to say that this money is not munificence, benevolence, uh, in the way that Res Gestae wants to characterize it, saying, hey, I want to share all my wealth with my lovely compatriots. It is bribery, isn't it? So he sees the office as bought. And why he's so upset with the Roman people is that they have exchanged liberty for prosperity, for ease of living. And he's angry about that, isn't he? Now, look at this, though. Who does he leave the money to in particular? The Praetorian Guard. Why do we need to know about the Praetorian Guard? They are so important. After this, they start to choose emperors. You know that, don't you? And they become a personal bodyguard. Now, if we're talking about traditions of the Republic, we should not have military force, should we, in Rome in this particular way. So he's leaving more money to the Praetorian Guard. What does that tell you? It means that he wanted to be defended. You could argue, I suppose, that he's remembered his uncle being murdered by the senators. But it seems to be more likely that there's a coercive element. That the military is in Rome. And 500 to each in the urban troops. Don't you find that interesting? Again, there's an element of self-interest in these gifts. And after Augustus, and indeed during his life, his body is protected by military force. That sounds like patestas to me, not autoritas. And I'm sure you agree as well. Okay. Now, I'm going to go very quickly here. Again, on to uh, number eight here. 
If we get any sort of question about the Senate, the Senate clamoured for the body, this is Augustus's body, to be carried to the pyre on the shoulders of the father, the Caesar with haughty moderation, this is Tiberius, excuse them from that duty and warn the people by edict not to repeat the enthusiastic excesses which on the former day had marred the funeral of the deified uh, Julius. Now, what's upsetting Tacitus here is the changing of the nature of Roman society from eschewing kings to making their emperors into gods so that what the Senate has become now is simply a chamber of sycophants. This is not the chamber of Cicero, is it, attacking Antony. This is not the place where power was checked, where there was a separation of powers. Now it is a place of, um, it is a place of sycophants, is it not? On to chapter 9. Then the tongues became busy with Augustus himself. Most men were struck by trivial points that one day should have been the first of his sovereignty. Look at this whole pattern. Sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. Insisting on the king-likeness of him. So like I said, he's going to reject Augustus's republican language, princeps and everything like that. And he insists on using the language of monarchy to drive home that, in his case, he is a monarch. He talks about him, his breaking of custom, his 12 um, uh, unbroken years as consul, the tribunician power. What is, uh, what is Tacitus setting out to do? He's setting out to unmask all of the emperor's powers and Augustus in particular. Now, very quickly, because I know we don't have that much time. When Lepidus grew old and indolent and Antony succumbed to his vices, etc., what um, Tacitus seems to want to do is to characterize Octavian as a bloodthirsty enfant terrible who really did undo everyone around him. Notice again, he despises the title first citizen because, again, he's suggesting that that masks all of the power that he actually had. Romanticization, there had been law for the Roman citizen, respect for all the allied communities and the capital itself had been embellished with remarkable splendor. So remember, we know, according to Suetonius, that Augustus boasted that, he went, that Rome went from bricks to marble. Well, Tacitus is acknowledging that. This is his attempt to be... Um, a little bit more objective. But all the time we're haunted by the idea that this came at an enormous cost. It came at the cost of the, of the Roman character, of their traditions, of the independence of people, of the liberty of people. So it's a bit like today when people say that, you know, we are giving up our civil rights to have econom an economic boom. It's the same kind of idea. So Tacitus is reminding us that a huge amount of Rome was actually lost. And look, he uses this beautiful metaphor, cloak. He merely used as a cloak. So even if you just remember that one word and you kind of swag it so that you put it into your essay and you say, this is this pattern of camouflaging. Look how Tacitus reveals how these titles mask, camouflage, etc., I think that one word cloak is absolutely incredible. And then at the bottom, after that there'd been undoubtedly peace, but peace with bloodshed. That again perfectly sums it up, doesn't it? This peace came at a high cost. Two civil wars, bloodshed of all different types, the prescriptions, all of that violence that then gets whitewashed out. What's Tacitus setting out to do? He's setting out to remind us that all of these things, you know, were the cost, okay? Now, I'm going to go just to the end and talk about questions. So Tacitus is absolutely essential for any essay title that deals with legacy and the kind of memory of Rome. What did Augustus leave behind? Tacitus is essential for anything in which you write about the Senate. 
If you talk about the powers of the Senate, you know, in some ways, Augustus increased the status of senators, didn't he? He curtailed the numbers, didn't he? He did various things. He upped the pay. He helped people, didn't he? So he could actually argue that the status of senators in some ways increased and improved, but within very uh, strict boundaries. The Republic. Was he the savior of the Republic? Well, Tacitus would say no, wouldn't he? And then you can use res gestae to say yes. Anything to do with Augustus's sovereignty and powers, Tacitus will always be that critic saying he has total power, he eroded the rule of law, he took away the separation of the powers. And the public works and achievements, you could definitely use that as well. Because Tacitus is saying, yeah, he did all these things. I agree. There was peace. The frontiers were better. It was a better built city, etc. But hey, let's not forget that something very valuable, something about the Roman spirituality, character, their sense of who they were, was lost. And in, uh, you know, to end off, girls, Tacitus is the ultimate riposte to res gestae. It's the ultimate balance. And it's one that, it's almost like he's reading res gestae and seeking to dismantle it. Don't you feel? Now I hope that that was useful. It was a whistle-stop tour.